And the young monk's like, all right, I went all the way up this 200 foot tree or whatever. Why didn't you say anything? You didn't say anything until I was almost gonna hit the ground. I already did it. And he said, when you're almost complete, that's when you're most likely to make a mistake. Hi, my name is Damon Brown of DameBrown.net. My main thing is helping you as a side hustler, a solopreneur, or otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur. Today, we're gonna to talk about the final 1%. Why we often will put our energy into something, go so hard into something, and then at the last second, things just fall apart. Have you experienced that? I know I certainly have. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. But a lot of it comes back to this simple parable that I believe I read in the 48 Laws of Power, but I read it like 15 years ago and I think about it all the time. There's a monk and there's a young monk. So an older one who's more of a mentor and a young one who's just getting out of the proverbial academy. His last lesson, the young monk, is to climb a tree, really tall tree. So the older monk comes out there and he's like, okay, go for it. And the young monk's eager, he goes, starts climbing a tree, he's super fast, he climbs all the way up, gets to the top. It's like, all right, come down. And then he comes down, and otherwise the monk is, the older monk is silent. Comes all the way down, all the way down, it's a tall tree. This is his last, his last lesson. And then when he's like 10 feet from the ground, a little bit taller than me perhaps, then the wise monk says, okay, be careful, watch your feet, slow down a little bit. And suddenly he's giving him all this advice. The young monk gets on the ground safely and he's like, congratulations. And the young monk's like, all right, I went all the way up this 200 foot tree or whatever. Why didn't you say anything? You didn't say anything until I was almost gonna hit the ground. I already did it. And he said, when you're almost complete, that's when you're most likely to make a mistake. Now, I mentioned this parable very briefly in uh, The Ultimate Bites as Entrepreneur. Thank you all for making it um, a bestseller a few years ago. So you can check out a little bit more about the final 1%, that's the name of the chapter. What I wanted to talk about in this show is more about why that final 1% ends up being so much of an issue. With the final 1%, that's when the pressure is the most and when we're most likely, frankly, to get the most lazy or at least the most complacent. Lazy sounds a little bit judgmental. I'll be a little bit easier on it. The most complacent. Because we think we got it already. Everything is fine. The problem with that, of course, is that it's not fine because you're not done. You're not at the finish line yet. So there are two ways to make sure that you can stay in this. The first thing, first thing, is to always keep the end in mind. As Stephen Covey of First Things First, in fact, I have a video about how to prioritize your life. It talks about the rocks analogy. Check that out. I'll be sure to throw a link in here uh, from Stephen Covey's book. What he talks about is to begin with end in mind and then work backwards from the end. Where do you want to end up? What's your main intention? Um, as some of my spiritual mentors and, and friends would say, what's the feeling that you want to feel when you're at the finish line? What does that look like? Start with that. You know, as Abraham Hicks would say, rest in peace to them. What is that feeling that you want to have? Hold that feeling and then work towards that. So essentially you're working backwards. There's goals that I have that are two, three, in some cases five years out and I already know the feeling that I'm going to have as I reach that goal. But then here's the trick beyond the spiritual side or the feeling side, the more emotive abstract side, once you capture that feeling, once you know where you want to end up, then everything else becomes easier because you're working backwards. For instance, if you want to publish a book in say three years, which is a good timeline, well then you have to get it to the final version, let's say a traditional publisher, you want to get the final version to the publisher. You need to do a book proposal. You need to have an agent who will actually work the book proposal and get in tip top shape. Before that, you need a skeleton of the book proposal. Before that, you need to practice your writing and figure out exactly what you want to say. You have to get your general craft together and maybe start networking, working with people who are writers, people who are agents. So once you do need find an agent or once you can't are to the point where you need an agent, it won't be as hard. You see how that works? And maybe that feeling is, I wanna have a book available in the local bookstore. And that's what you, the feeling you wanna concentrate on for three years from now. 
right? It's 2021 right now. So in 2024, I'm gonna have a book on the shelf that's available for my family to buy and it will be at the local Barnes and Nobles. Work backwards from there. That allows you to not get sloppy in the final 1% because you know, if you don't have that feeling yet, you're not done. Just like the young monk, as he was getting more excited, coming down the tree, that final 1% is where he was most likely to fall down. Even if it was only 10 feet, he still wouldn't have accomplished what he would have accomplished. And wouldn't that be a shame to go up 200 feet, to come down 190, and then to fall apart? But we do that all the time. I think often it's because we don't focus on the feeling we want to have at the end. Instead, we're focused on whatever the next step is. That's when we start to get sloppy. The second part, shout out to Jen A. Miller, who uh, did a book called Running, A Love Story. She's a colleague of mine. I actually mentioned her a couple times. She's a marathon runner. And one of the things that I learned from reading her writing, as well as some of my relatives who have ran marathons, I come from a family of runners, is to always make sure you have enough energy to go beyond the finish line. Marathon runners, and I used to do more basic running, not marathons, people talk about a wall, right? You might've heard about that. You hit a certain wall. If you're a marathon runner, that wall, I believe is around 23 miles of that 26 mile marathon. To finish a marathon, you have to get through the wall. The wall means that your body, or more importantly, your mind, knows that you're almost done. You push yourself for 23 miles. Think about that. I ran a mile or two. People push themselves for 23 miles. They know they have three more miles to go. Any other time, any other day, if you're a marathon runner, you're used to running miles at a time. But today, mentally, you know you have 26 miles. You're pushing yourself as hard as you can. The weather might be bad, whatever issues might happen on marathon day. And your mind's like, well, you got three more miles to go. We're gonna start shutting down. That's what they call the wall. Now you might experience that again, like I have, where you might run a mile or two and at seven, uh, 75% of that mile, <laughs> we hit the 0.75 point of that mile, suddenly you start getting really tired and winded. That's your mind. So what you really wanna do is go a little bit beyond. Expect that you're gonna go beyond. There's so many people, and um, Jen and other people have written about, who've written about running have talked about this all the time. There's so many people who work their life, work their life, work their whole life, they work their life too, work their whole life to have this experience. And then they end up falling apart in that last mile, that last proverbial 1%. But that's because they start mentally checking out and saying, oh, I'm almost done. I can slow down a little bit. That's not what you want to do. You want to know when you're complete, but you also want to have the energy to move forward. It's so important to know what your intention is, even before you start the journey. And number one, if you know what kind of feeling you want to have at the end, and then work backwards from there, that'll make sure you don't skip any steps. As, what, as Seth Godin would say, you don't take the shortcut, you take the long cut. You make sure everything is taken care of. Going back to the book analogy, imagine if you got a book deal tomorrow, but you haven't written a word before. How much pain and suffering, <laughs> you're talking about writer, how much pain and suffering would you go through because you don't know what you're doing? You didn't take the time. You didn't learn your learn the craft. You didn't, maybe you didn't get a proper agent. There's a lot of sloppiness there and it makes it so much harder to actually succeed. And so that final 1% might take forever. You might quit along the way because you haven't done the proper work. Second part, as Jan talks about, is that you wanna have the energy to go beyond just the finish line. Because once you get to that final 1%, there's gonna be a lot of mental things that are gonna be happening. And if you make sure that you're thorough for that, not saying I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna stop a little bit beyond that, then you're more likely to succeed. If you wanna get more insight like this in regards to setting your goals, be sure and check out my playlist called Smart Creative Habits and Routines. It's like 12 episodes short like this. It's insight from uh, Simon Sinek, from Brene Brown. Um, I think Beyonce might be on there, but all kinds of uh, cultural influencers, 
um, thought leaders and people who are insightful about how to do really strong goal setting and how to get the habits. It's not always about reaching a certain goal, but about creating the habits and the routines to allow you to reach those goals. You wanna be consistent, not just aggressive. Until next time, remember to bring your worth and that you can always build from now. Take care.